Welcome, everyone. Are you ready for today? <laughs> now, before I get started, I'm going to ask uh, our three straw poll questions. And I'd like everyone to put their hand up, have a quick look around the room. Dave got you guys nice and warmed up, so you should be ready to look around. Here's the first question. Who has had a cup of coffee today? Look around the room. I'd like to see some house lights, if that's possible. Second question. Who has made a friend or started a relationship over a cup of coffee? Nice. Third and final question. Who knows someone who drinks coffee? <laughs> there is nothing more Canadian than going for coffee. In fact, it is really the great Canadian handshake. So let's talk about our love affair with a fresh cup. 68% of Canadian adults drink three cups of coffee every day. That translates into 15 billion cups in Canada each year. What's interesting about coffee is over the past probably about 12, 14 years, consumption hasn't changed a lot in Canada. We're about 104 liters per capita in terms of our consumption. What has changed, though, is back in 1998, only 2% of the coffee consumed was specialty coffee. Now, in 2012, it's 25%. So it's not that we're drinking more coffee. It means we're drinking better quality coffee. Our palates are changing, case in point. Victoria is Canada's coffee mecca. Did you know that? We have more coffee roasters per capita in Canada than any other city in the country. That's a shout out to Victoria. <laughs> coffee stirs our emotions. It makes friendships. It really truly is a catalyst to our daily lives. So I'm going to take you back in time just a little bit. Back in the early 90s, I uh, started my first business. I was 22 years of age. I started a health club. I worked for two years, almost every single day, doing personal training, teaching fitness classes, and I almost got burned out. So I hopped on a plane, and I flew to Costa Rica by myself. I arrived in Costa Rica, Costa Rica as they refer to it, and I felt a little lost. People were super friendly, we went on a couple of, you know, traditional horseback riding tours. But then I realized the number one export in Costa Rica was coffee. And the lady at the front desk of the hotel said, you know, there's a brand new coffee plantation tour. You want to go on that. So I got together with six people in the hotel. We hopped on a small little bus, and we went up some jagged edge cliff. And we got to this family-run plantation. We walked among the plantation. I learned that coffee, in fact, was the seed of a cherry. I didn't know that. I watched coffee being harvested. I watched it being processed. I watched them separate the bean from the fruit. The family was incredibly gracious. They took us into this other room, and for the very first time, I watched coffee being roasted. Now, I thought I loved coffee, but then after this experience, I truly, truly fell in love with it. It was my maiden voyage, as I refer to it as. So, I came back on the plane, long journey home, contemplated life, heading back to reality. We all have those sort of post-travel blues. But I realized the next entrepreneurial adventure for me was going to be in the coffee industry. So over the next few years, while I continued to run the health club, I researched coffee. I read about it. By the way, it is a vastly enormous industry. Um, I've been in it for 14 years, and there's not a day goes by that I don't learn something little about the industry. So, at that moment in time, I just, as I started to form my, my business plan, and I looked around at what I wanted to do, I realized that I wanted to roast coffee. And I couldn't roast coffee in an urban setting because I couldn't get the smoke out of my mind that was generated in that country, uh, that family-run plantation down in Costa Rica. So 
I knew that that was going to be a barrier for me to enter into the coffee industry. And I knew that I didn't want to buy someone else's coffee. I wanted to create a roastery cafe. And some of you might remember in the late 90s, there was an emergence of uh, brew pubs. There's, people started making beer on site and serving it on site. And I wanted to create a roastery cafe. I wanted you to walk into the cafe, watch us roast coffee, come and ask questions. I wanted to make it totally accessible. Smoke was a problem. Now, for those of you who don't know, coffee technology has not changed in about 100 years. It's very rudimentary. But to learn how to roast coffee is an incredibly difficult task. You have to pretty much know a little bit of black magic. You have to be mechanically inclined. But it is, without question, an artisan skill. Single-pass coffee roasters are simply described as this. They take room temperature air. They put it into the heat exchanger, heat the air to about 400 degrees Celsius. They pass that hot air through the green coffee one time. The hot air leaves the roasting chamber, along with it a whole bunch of dust particles and volatile organic compounds as the roast develops. See, there's natural oil and sugars that exist in the coffee seed, and as they get heated, there's a chemical change that causes volatile organic com compounds, or VOCs. In order to manage those VOCs, traditional gas fire coffee roasters then take that 400C air and they put it through an afterburner and superheat it to 800 degrees C or more. So you can imagine how much hot air is going out the stack all the time. Single pass gas fired technology puts emissions out 100% of the time. Now, in small communities, if you ever wanted to find out how well small communities receive those coffee roasting emissions, you can Google coffee roasting emission complaints. <laughs> and I can tell you, you could spend pretty much an entire day reading all the various small stories, and some large, on how communities receive the emissions of coffee roasting. So that barrier had to be dealt with. There's no way I was going to start a business and put a lot of money into it and risk uh, being shut down by the neighbors that you were trying to have love your product. That made little sense. So my tenacity, for those that you know me, um, <laughs> I went on a journey to find unique coffee technology. And I found it right here in Canada. And two inventors, uh, Yarmir Friedrich and Raymond Lemaire, were working on a closed loop fluidized bed roaster. Fluidized, by the way, is a fancy word for hot air. And they were working on a closed loop roasting method. And I quickly realized that that roaster was going to change the face of retail coffee roasting in urban centers across this country. So we formed a partnership over our mutual passion for roasting and serving freshly roasted coffee in an urban setting. For me, this guy represented as a child creative thinking. I loved everything about Willy Wonka. Now, it's always refreshing when you meet people that think outside the box. I mean, that phrase is used all the time. Oh, he thinks out of the box, she thinks out of the box. But have you ever met a person that thinks outside of the box that you think you're thinking out of? <laughs> that would be Yarmir and Raymond. They weren't looking at just managing smoke. No, no. They were looking way ahead. They wanted to manage the energy consumption, which I hadn't even really considered. I was just worried about the smoke. Closing the loop created a whole bunch of complications in terms of the coffee roasting process, managing heat, managing the emissions, and moisture. A couple of things about coffee. Coffee loses about 15 to 18% of its weight when it's roasted, doubles in size. And the reason it's brown is because of the natural sugars that are contained in the coffee that are caramelized during the roasting process. The process is actually called the Maillard process. So after four generations of design, we're finally there. 
Now, if I, was ask, if I was to ask most of you about sustainability in coffee, you would use words like fair trade, organic, shade-grown. Some might even throw in a comment about a compostable or reusable cup. Nobody talks about the process in terms of sustainability after the product leaves the farmer to the point of consumption. There's a big piece in the middle, and that's roasting. Some of you might ask yourself, you know, why bother? What's the point? We've been roasting coffee a certain way for about 100 years. But if you remember the questions I asked at the beginning, and you looked around the room, and every single person put their hand up, that is why we need to pay attention to the sustainability of coffee from a roasting perspective, because it impacts every single person in this room, likely. And globally, I think that pretty much, again, if you scaled that up, I think you would agree that it's similar in other countries. So we started roasting coffee, we did a lot of testing, we did sample sizes, and then we actually went on a fairly large process of testing. And over the course of the year, we roasted 30,000 pounds of coffee and calculated how much energy we consumed and did the same in a similar size, single pass gas-fired roaster. And we discovered that our closed loop method, where we reclaim the heat, we manage the emission, and reintroduce that heat back into the roasting chamber, required a fraction of the energy. And I'm going to show you what that looked like based on one pound. So we roasted a lot of coffee, broke the numbers down so that we could manage that number in our heads. And our roaster is electric, so we had to convert the kilowatt hours into BTUs. And our roaster consumed 20 times less energy. Now, if I said to you today, I invented something that would give your car 20 times better gas mileage, would you pay attention? <laughs> I think so. Not only are we using 20 times less energy, but we actually produce 85% less emissions because we're not even open to atmosphere for 85% of our roasting cycle. So we looked at the energy that's being wasted in single gas fired or single pass gas fired coffee roasting, and we did some calculations. And the energy wasted over the course of 30,000 pounds is equivalent to the energy consumed in eight single family dwellings. Scale that up, and that's over 12,000 homes that could be powered by energy conservation. Imagine any small community in Canada of 25,000 where the entire community is powered by conservation alone. Why the barbecue? Barbecue represents what 50,000 BTUs looks like. If you're a small, single-pass, gas-fired coffee roaster, you're using equivalent to 10 barbecues every hour, running on high with the lid up, and I don't think there's one of us in the room that would leave our barbecue on high with the lid up hour after hour after hour. Let's look at the CO2 production of that. Over the course of that sample size, we had 30,000 pounds of coffee, single pass, gas fired roasters, produced 99 tons of CO2. Our closed loop method was 4.8. And let's use something that we can relate to. We can relate to car vehicles and the CO2 from cars. So that's 19 single family passenger vehicles versus one car. So that's like pulling 18 cars off the road in that very, very small sample size. Scale that up to 477 million pounds of coffee that are roasted in Canada every year, and that would be like driving in downtown Vancouver with 30,000 less vehicles during rush hour every day. <laughs> We've gone from horse and buggy to four-barrel carbureted pickup truck to fuel injection to electric cars. So I asked the question, why are we not considering energy conservation on our favorite national beverage? So I'm going to break coffee down on a personal level so everyone sort of understands that three cup thing. Remember earlier I mentioned that each of us consumes three cups? If you took those three cups roasted in our closed loop roasting technology, it would be equivalent to running a 100 watt light bulb for less than 16 minutes, less than the time of this presentation. If you took those same three cups of coffee, roasted it in a single pass gas-fired coffee roaster, it would be equivalent to five hours and 25 minutes of light bulb time. 
Coffee is not going away. And I'm not suggesting that we stop making friends or going on dates over it. What I'm suggesting is that we look at the energy used in the roasting process. For me, coffee sustainability is more than the growing, harvesting, and the buying practice. It's more than the compostable cup. Our journey into this over the past 12 years was to invent an energy efficient coffee roaster that provided a high level of roast consistency, reduced emissions dramatically without abandoning the artisan aspect of creating great tasting coffee. For me, it's been a life-changing opportunity. I get to work in the chocolate factory with Mr. Wonka. <laughs> I get to affect an industry. I get to help bring to light some of the realities behind our daily cup. And I hope today, walking you through this 12 your journey helps you understand a little bit more about the cup. And we believe this. Freshly roasted coffee does not have to come at the expense of our environment. Thank you.